Yeah? yeah? Right? Yes. Deal? Doing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. module for that there of course there is i thought at some point that i was seeing um a bunch of great session stuff that our community is talking about at drupal camps but not every drupal camp can afford to make high quality video recordings and get all the sessions online and sometimes even the ones that are recorded are maybe um not easily found and uh, I thought it would be nice to, to share those with a broader audience, try and make them a little more findable. Um, and I also liked the idea of just having a even more Drupal Camp in my life, which is why I'm calling this series Jam's Drupal Camp. It's basically an extension of the Acquia podcast, but we're doing it on a video, and I'm planning on having a bunch of great guests so first up and first guest in Jam's Drupal Camp, Marek Sotek. Marek, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thanks. Marek, what is it that you do in Drupal? Okay, so, well, my main objectives right now is more about usability and user experience. Um, some of the people might know me as a root candy theme creator, which was quite popular back then, an admin theme. So, but I'm as well, a, you know, Drupal developer. I do the module development. I do theming, all these kind of things around. So, yeah. Let's see how this goes. Uh, the idea here now is that we shift into Drupal Camp session mode, and um, all of you lovely people have come here to see Marek give his talk, which is called "Get Off the Phone: Helping Users Through Better UX and." tools and at this stage I can say that I saw you give this talk for the first time in Copenhagen and I I was very impressed I really enjoyed it I thought it was um, valuable and I think a, an important point to point out is that um, the usability and the stuff that you're talking about and the solution that you propose is not just for Drupal you're you're actually aiming to give developers on a lot of other platforms this solution so I find that exciting and um you gave this session in vienna as well right yes how besides besides my reaction and obviously i was impressed by your session what kind of feedback have you been getting around this stuff um i would say uh, you know some people because I'm, I'm talking there as well about the user-centered design and uh, it's kind of interesting to see that even developers are come uh, well were at this session and uh, even developers learn some some new things about that. It's called, or you can call it user-centered design. There are different approaches. There are different approaches how to do research. So I think that that's the most valuable thing for for the for the visitors or yeah for the listeners. Okay, so I am going to give you the full focus. So even if I make a noise, my face won't come on camera now, and you can switch over to sharing your slides um, and we'll get underway with your Drupal Camp session. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for having me. I'm clicking the button. So you should be able to see my screen, my presentation. Is that correct? Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So welcome everybody. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll just briefly introduce myself again. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Marek Sotek. I am a web developer for the past 14 plus years and something. I'm with Drupal for about eight plus years. And my main focus right now is design, research, user experience. And um, what uh, we are going to talk about here uh, today is um, about uh, how we can improve the site or whatever we are working on, even a product on a website, uh, how we can improve it to make it better, to, to make the user feel better and to you know, get less support that gets up. So um, 
one day I realized that uh, because I have as well an agency in London which is called Atomic Ant and we are doing uh, Drupal websites or Drupal based websites and one day I realized that we have a problem with uh, handing over a documentation when the job is done and when I'm talking about documentation I mean the documentation for the end users for the actual clients that are using the, the uh, CMS Drupal and uh, this usually was that we created like uh, 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 PDF with screenshots with you know all these kind of things and uh, we weren't able to update it it wasn't even read that much often or still we were getting the phone calls from from the uh, our from our clients uh, so I thought that uh, this is our problem that we need to fix because we are losing a lot of time that we could spend on some different things that we would enjoy much more and as well uh, a lot of money on this one so I went uh, I went out and I tried to create some sort of like a research and this research was about uh, whether it's really just us that are uh, having this issue with, with handing over documentation for the end users and I was really curious how the others do it and I really thought that there must be some sort of a solution that others are um, using so uh, I created sort of like an interview script and called about 30 subjects these were Drupal companies individuals and even other companies using WordPress and you know uh, other uh, systems just doing the web development and all of these were uh, around the world uh, I use Skype so we were just calling and screen sharing and and they were showing me what they were doing uh, so I created some sort of like hypothesis and the first hypothesis was that the interview will actually reveal the difficulty of creating this agile documentation and um, that was something that we were struggling with uh, it showed up that uh, about 40% of the interviews were not doing any documentation at all and it was really frustrating so uh, I guess if you have the similar issues you you are frustrated uh, your technical writers are frustrated or whoever is creating the documentation um, they are frustrated uh, and because they know that it's not going to be read and so on and uh, so 40% of these interviews uh, are not doing anything and they rely only on the phone call support. Uh, some people as well express that uh, you know the documentation department would be nice, but there is no sim there is no budget for that, or it's really hard to budget it. Uh, the the second hypothesis was that the problem interviews were validated that uh, the customers use one or more or even you know any other alternatives or anything that would you know uh, provide a better application documentation for for the end users but we found out that nobody is you know having any solution in place that would be uh, sufficient that that would help them and with which they would be really happy the and then uh, when we came down to what they are using uh, it, it showed up that the screenshots are us usually used uh, like a, in 30 percent and uh, you know the screenshots is, is really a painful area where you have to recreate the screenshots every time that you change the application in any way uh, even if you imagine like let's say for localization it doesn't fit anymore or you add a new menu button or anything like that um, you have to recreate the screenshots again and again and the more more complicated the app is or the web applications or Drupal uh, um, interface is the, the hardest it is to create all these screenshots uh, so there is a high pain level in that uh, then the screencasts uh, were used in 23% um, of interviews uh, and uh, they were actually working for the uh, for the clients uh, at some point uh, some people said that not that uh, not that often because it's hard to you know you don't really want to wait uh, five minutes to really you reveal just one hint that you know that is there somewhere so it's it's not possible to read through if you don't have it uh, transcript and um, again it's really hard to reuse the same with the screen uh, screenshots that it's really hard to reuse screencasts uh, 
if you if you have a different application, if it's if it's not covering like the if you really want to cover the your user interface, your colors, your branding, and clients' branding. Uh, some of the people were doing workshops, uh, and these workshops uh, were uh, held only when it was necessary to educate the whole team of people. Um, it's really painful and expensive. Uh, it also takes a lot of time to prepare, and it uh, takes a one developer's uh, time, full time, really. And again, the workshops were often followed by the phone call support. And of course, the phone call support, uh, it's, uh, you know, most of the people were using that uh, because they, if, if it came to like uh, creating the documentation or any other knowledge base or anything like that, they always fall back to, to just phone call support because uh, they know that it's a pain to create something feasible uh, for, for documentation for the cl client to use. Uh, Right, so, so the research results were that uh, even the well-established companies, the big ones, uh, they don't have any idea how to improve the process. They don't have anything in place. Uh, there is usually no budget uh, for, for creating this documentation because it's really hard to budget this. And especially when you don't really know, uh, I mean, you can document the functionalities there, but it might change during the development. So in case of screenshots, you have to redo them all the time. So this is just a pie chart of the solutions that the people were using, the interview people. So the screenshots are dom dominating. And uh, so the question is, what, what, are the, uh, what are the options then? That, you know, because the, this research kind of showed us that uh, there is really a need for, us, for such a tool that will improve this kind of workflow. And for first, it's, it's the support calls. Uh, uh, that uh, let me switch here. Uh, the support calls uh, are quite expensive. Are the most actually expensive? It's in a big companies. It will cost you like about twelve dollars a call, and that means uh, that uh, takes in account that you have an actually an offshore uh, support call center. Uh, support chat. You know you still require a person to answer. Uh, workshops that's really exp expensive takes a lot of time you have web ticketing still need a person there uh, then you can build a knowledge base which comes to sort of like a self-help um, and uh, here you can use the screencast screenshots uh, which I already explained the, the pain areas there uh, you can create solutions articles you know to, to help the users sort of like a uh, that they can find what they were looking for uh, to a solution to their problem. Or you can use the better user experience, uh, which, uh, you know, that you will create uh, the buttons much, much more visible, or you can declutter the user interface. Uh, and uh, the thing with the user experience uh, or better user interface is that uh, it won't cover all the workflows. Or if you, are, if you have something more, uh, uh, more advanced, uh, you are not going to cover, let's say, how to create article from one place to other if you have multiple fields there or different, uh, different, uh, you know, uh, options to select from. So my personal bus is the, uh, you know, approach it from uh, try not to get in involved with any support like phone call support or or anything like that that I showed. Uh, before, but try to first uh, improve the user experience and then uh, come up with a self-help uh, solution. And by self-help here, uh, self-help support means that it it allows to uh, the users of your application to actually help themselves. So uh, it could be like a, a offline or not really an offline, but uh, a place, a knowledge base where you can find all the solutions to your problems. Uh, which means that the users will find it themselves. Um, the other good uh, example of self-help support is, let's say, forums, where actually if you have an uh, open app uh, web application where you have users and you know that uh, the user base is big, it's not like just the clients, uh, you can create a forum where users will be asking questions, sort of, uh, and then they will be, they will be answering them as well. 
and sort of like a stack exchange, for example, that's like a self-help support example. So when it comes to the uh, better user experience, uh, I came up uh, or came to the uh, design uh, museum in Copenhagen uh, like one month ago or so when I was there for this Drupal camp. Uh, and there was one uh, kind of nice uh, paragraph about uh, the design. And let me just read that. Things that are aesthetically pleasing, which we enjoy looking at or touching, and which are attractive, make us feel good. And when we feel good, our thinking is more creative and we have an easier time solving the problems we face. How to use a particular object, for example, or that could be, in our case, a web application. And which comes to that uh, when the things are attractive, beautiful, appealing, aesthetic, you know, uh, they work better because they evoke positive feelings and inspire more creative thinking. Uh, now, uh, this kind of ex inspired me to a little bit change my, my presentation and uh, you will see uh, what I came up with afterwards. Uh, so one of the aspects of uh, coming up with a better user experience is this U UCD, user-centered design. And what uh, essentially user-centered design is, is a type of user interface design um, and a process in which the needs, wants, and limitation of end users of a product, a product or you know, your website or CMS are given extensive attention at each stage of the design process, which means that you are really trying to understand the user and try to build in uh, the, the user needs and wants and limitations. Uh, now, when you when you do uh, you know design your uh, your web application to support the user's existing beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors, uh, you know you can then increase the user friendliness, usability of your web application, which might lead to the increased sales, reach business goals, or like I was talking about before, is to decrease let's say race tickets, support tickets, because they they uh, you know will operate with the website much more easier. Uh, when it comes to the uh, user-centered design, when you come up with, um, you know, trying this or uh, trying to applicate or bring it into application, uh, you can use these user perspectives, uh, which are essentially like the needs and wants, goals, motivation and triggers, obstacles and limitations, and so on. Uh, it's not really like uh, something rigid that you have to stick all, to all of these, but you have to understand your users. You have to find what users, what your users are, and apply these user perspectives, or you might eventually come up with a new perspective, uh, which will be best for your users. So for example, geography and language might be uh, not useful for some sort of web application. Uh, certainly the UCD, uh, the user-centered design, is not just that you have to do what the user asks for. So um, you have to think about the business as well. So it's not really just a strict, or at least for, from my perspective, it's not just a strict, uh, you know, looking at the user, but as well, you have to take in the business needs and make the best out of it. Uh, there's a one motto from, from our uh, a Czech entrepreneur, Tomáš Batia, which is very well uh, known for his shoes. And his motto was, our customer is our master. And I'm sure that he didn't mean it like, um, um, you know, whenever a customer came to him and said, well, we need pink shoes or something, that they will immediately do pink shoes as they wished or something like that. But they would, you know, uh, find out what's what's best, uh, how to approach it and find out the best solution. Uh, which comes to another example uh, from, uh, there's a quote from Theodore Levitt, a Harvard marketing professor, uh, and he said, uh, people don't want to buy a quarter-inch drill, they want to buy a quarter-inch hole. Uh, which, uh, as an example, might be that um, a guy comes to, to a salesman to a shop and he asks him, uh, I need a quarter-inch drill. And the salesman, would, without asking, him, asking this guy, he would just you know, give him a drill and then the guy left uh, and you know, maybe he, he doesn't need a drill. What, why he needs that? Or, there's no questions about that. And then he find out that it's not useful for him because he, he just said because he needs quarter inch drill, but he didn't do any, uh, any uh, 
you know, find out what he really needs. So the, if the salesman asked him, like, what's, uh, what are your needs? What do you need a quarter inch uh, drill for? And then he might start, well, because um, I need to make a hole in, in, in the wall. Or, uh, and then he will continue and you can ask him more and more. And then you will find out that he just needs to uh, hang his picture on, on the wall. And then you, you know, then you find out, well, okay, maybe you just need a, uh, you then find out what's the best solution for him. So you will give him the, the right drill, the, the right equi equipment for that. But without asking, you wouldn't know. And, uh, you know, the customer might, might at the end be very unsatisfied because the quarter inch drill that he wanted is not going to fix his issue. Um, in user-centered design, you can use these disciplines. Uh, again, it's, it's not a, uh, yeah, you can use whatever will apply best for you uh, for your project. So you can use information architecture, interaction design, visual design, research, usability, you know, and many others, whatever comes comes in. And when it comes to the process, you start with a research. Uh, then you create a concept design, then you evaluate it. So that that is kind of this flow from creating the wireframes, uh, then you know low fidelity wireframes, creating some sort of designs. You can create mood boards. You evaluate it. You can do testing with the users uh, on site or off site, or you know get some feedback there. Uh, what I would add to this process as well, uh, which is quite important, is deploy and learn. Uh, so once you deploy, uh, that's where where all your learning starts because till now you were just researching you were just trying out with some people there but uh you know you might have done let's say a mistake there that you took uh, a, a wrong uh, wrong people for testing or you had some assumptions that you didn't test so afterwards you launch something and it can be anything uh, it can be any website it can be an e-commerce site or anything you you should really learn from that what uh, what you have just built because that's something where you are testing your new stuff that you just created uh, I mean this is something that's very obvious for let's say e-commerce sites but it's not that uh, because there you can see whether the you know sales are better or not but not for the normal websites from which you can still learn quite a lot and what you have done so when it comes to the research um, here is the uh, one of the examples that I did in uh, while I was working in a uh, one Swiss bank, and we were working on a support portal for 100,000 people, and it was actually a self-help support portal. So here uh, I thought I need to improve something because it it wasn't based on uh, my assumptions and based on some statistics. It wasn't working very well. So I took this uh, little approach, I call it like micro approach, where I take just one thing and analyze it. And then I will see what, what will come up uh, with that. The only problem there was that I only had like access logs. And for those who don't, who don't know what access log is, it's just basically just lines of, of accesses in the server log. Uh, but it will tell you uh, where the users were, where they were going, and uh, what time, and which page they, they visited. So it was enough for me to, to work with that. But you can, you can use any like Google Analytics or any tracking systems you have. So I created, based on these, I created some sort of like a charts that, that helped me, uh, you know, uh, to identify which pages I, I should focus on. Um, and uh, and as well, user flows with these dendrograms. Um, and from here, we can, let's say, see it was quite interactive. And you, you were able to click on one of the parts and then continue and seeing where the user goes and where they return and, and so on. And here I decided, because one of the you know most important part of the support portal is a search. So I, I started researching the search. and. Uh, you know, it might seem that it's quite obvious, but uh, sometimes, like, uh, I tend to say that we sometimes take granted that things that are out of the box on a widely used system work as they should. Uh, let's say uh, we take Drupal, we install it, we use some sort of a module that creates their own user interface, and we kind of think that, okay, well, that's right, because it has, let's say, 20,000 installations, 20 other thousand uh, uh, people are using this and their visitors. So we think, well, 
that's probably working. So we are not going to research it at all, or we are not. It's not really in our focus. So we tend to be lazy in these kind of things. And uh, so what I started doing is that this was our initial design, uh, which was in place. That's just a search box, uh, regular Drupal search, uh, with a with a button and a text. And um, here, uh, you know, I set my personal goals for for this research. And first of all, first of all, I wanted to show the team that we don't know much about the users. Showcase research approaches. So how how the research can be done. Um, make search to be used more often, and make user centered design one of the processes. So that that were quite high level goals. Um, and then the output should have been like an analysis of how the search was delivered as a presentation and sent out to all team members and managers, just so they know what we can do. Uh, so the search analysis, uh, so we wanted to increase the use of self-help content, uh, and which will then uh, lead to the decreased raised tickets. Uh, we assume from the feedback that we got from the current users and from the ratings and, uh, and uh, our own gut feeling that uh, uh, search is not working. Uh, so that's why we chose this. Uh, what I did is I created a simple scenario, kind of like a user story, where you say, what's the ideal workflow of, uh, you know, the when the user will feel positive about the service. So here I just put in like uh, that the user will see the search field because they came to the portal, they, they want to search uh, a solution to their problem. They enter the search name, they you know, click the buttons, find the solution. If, if they didn't find the right answer, uh, they will search again, they read the solution, and they optionally perform any other action that might help others, like rate the solution to make it more visible for others later, and then exit peacefully, peacefully with problem fixed and spread how much they love the portal and the service itself. So that's the ideal uh, user story for our use case here. Uh, so when I did this uh, analysis, I found out that there's, these are just like uh, uh, the keywords that people are searching for, let's say, in one day. And uh, there's this strange blank uh, keyword. So I found out that uh, there's some sort of like a strange blank keyword. Uh, I asked what the blank keyword is, uh, and it's kind of, it's a, a functionality that it was built like that because when, when you search for blank keyword, you actually enter the blank keyword, it's the word blank. It will show you the filters on the site. It will list all the content with pagination, and then you can filter down. So <clears throat> that's kind of like a strange, strange behavior, right? So I was thinking, okay, well, uh, let's see if that works, or if the if the filters are actually being used and uh, how it really works. Um, so. I put in the slides some more kind of information that you can go through it. I, I don't think I will, uh, I'm not going to go through all of these things, but you can then reread it. Uh, there are some more kind of informations. Uh, but what I found out is that the uh, search is being uh, used from the homepage for about 1,100 times, the search uh, page uh, 510 times, and the refer 110, and so on. And this is just the blank keyword or the blank word search. Now, uh, why is it that uh, people are actually searching for the blank keyword from the home page where they should come in and say, uh, I'm looking for, let's say, problem with my outlook or so. Um, so this was a little bit a surprise. And I found out that when you, when you don't fill in anything and you click the search button, it will actually lead to the search for the, for the blank page, for the blank keyword. So that was a problem because the users were actually misusing this or you know they should be entering the keyword there to get more results and to fix their solution uh, or to fix their problem. And then the other part was uh, why are people searching for the blank keyword uh, from search page actually? So that means that the workflow would be that you search for something and then you search again for the blank keyword. And I found out that there is a bug that whenever you actually search for something, uh, you enter a keyword, it goes to the search uh, search page, and you click the button again, uh, it will go to the blank page. 
with a blank keyword. And then there was a blank uh, refer referral with a blank keyword in there, so that was something that needed to be rewritten as well. So, uh, you know, I was trying to find out, uh, if you remember, the, whether the filters are being used from these kind of analyzes, I found out that the filters, as well from the access log, were used only 20 times from all these thousands of usages. So that's, uh, the conclusion was that the page doesn't work as it was designed. So that, that was like a first thing that I came up with. And what did we just achieve by just, you know, looking at one keyword, at this blank keyword? We found out all these kind of three quite big issues that were there, as well one uh, bug that, that can be fixed in the code. And, uh, you know, the, the our conclusion was that the basic search user experience seemed frustrating and, you know, adds time spent on the site while searching and not leading to the uh, search, to the positive search uh, feedback or feeling. So what was important here that we had this analysis and it wasn't based on assumptions that was basically really important for the managers that, you know, they have numbers behind it so they can say, okay, well, this is how the users are uh, behaving. So then you can take this and continue uh, you know, testing it with the users or just finding out whether it applies. So back to our search and find form. So what we wanted to do afterwards is to kind of increase the search, right, from the home page. And here are kind of like obvious uh, goals with this. So let's make it bigger, let's make it more uh, uh, prominent and uh, how do we make people to actually type in more keywords? Because as you might have seen before, they were just typing like one keyword. Like let's say uh, the people, what were they doing? They, if they had a problem with Outlook, they would just type in Outlook and that's it. Uh, which obviously wouldn't find uh, many you know, solutions for their specific problem because they didn't specify it enough. So um, we, we had to find out how we will make them think about it more and to type in more keywords. And it turned out to be quite simple. And this is the, the second uh, version, the, the version afterwards. So what, what we did here is that uh, you can see that the call to action is more, uh, more like a call to action. So it's not like search and find, but it's do you need help? Which uh, from our finding is that, you know, people are coming to the portal, they need help. So where do I look? So there's a big, title, do you need help? So yes, I need help. And then uh, you can see the, the whole input field is bigger, the search field is bigger and green, uh, so it's more prominent. And uh, then we just made a small uh, adjustment to the text, to the placeholder text there, which used to be search assist, that we typed in ask a question or enter a search term here, which allowed the people to actually, or it made the people to Write more, uh, write more words. So they were instantly they were starting to write. How do I uh, fix my Outlook, or how do I fix this 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 problem in Outlook, and so on, which led to quite interesting feedback from uh, let's say our our department because they were asking, uh, you know, how much time or how much money did you spend on this feature that we can now recognize the questions. And it's quite simple because the, all the solutions articles with where they were, you know, uh, explaining how to fix the solution, uh, the, the problem, uh, they were, they had these titles which were called, let's say, how do I fix this or how do, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of like a question way. So this helped the users to type in more and get more relevant feedback or search results for their problem. Uh, when it came to me measuring, uh, because as I said before, I needed some sort of like an output. And uh, so you, you define your key performance uh, indicators. And these were based on the goals. So are users searching from a uh, homepage more often? Are users clicking search button only? Or are users asking questions? Are users entering more than one word? And based on these, I created charts, uh, whether it improved or not. So here, for example, you can see that the, the uh, blue is the week before the uh, deploy. So that was the initial box. 
and then the red is the week after and the orange is the two weeks after and you can see how, how much it increased really over these two weeks uh, how much people actually were starting searching more often and more often from the home page so that was a success the blanks uh, that well, did some difference but not that much you can improve there uh, the how to searches so people were asking actually more questions that improved as well so people were getting used to asking questions more often uh, then we measured uh, single keyword searches searches and multiple keywords that improved a little bit as well you can still do a better there and then we had this second second option well a new proposal for the new version which you can see below there there was some sort of more uh, of a feedback like popular searches so that allowed users to see what they can type in let's say if they want to order outlook they have this already uh, suggestions uh, based on what is uh, what the demand is right now so if you click on ordering blackberry it will kind of uh, auto fill the the input field and you can click search and uh, yeah, it's kind of allowed users to to think again more about that they can enter more than just one one keyword. So uh, that was uh, something that we uh, you know we with a really simple uh, touches we improved quite a lot, and uh, uh, I can say that the users were actually afterwards liking it much more, and they were getting uh, more results, and they were as well uh, the the usage of the portal itself increased. Uh, now, when, so that was the better user experience. Now the, the other aspect was the, uh, or the other uh, thing was the self-help portals, which can consist of knowledge base, which will have, have to have the effective search, categorization, uh, it will support the web ticketing, like support agents, so they can you know, uh, choose which topic, uh, which ticket they want to fix. And what, what is interesting about the self-help is that, um, uh, you know, there was a, su a survey, uh, a survey uh, created by one company, and uh, they found out that 75% of survey respondents said that self-service is a convenient way to address customer service issues. And 67% of respondents said that they preferred self-service over speaking to a company representative. So we can see that 67% of people would really want to first help themselves instead of picking up a phone or raising a ticket or you know they would really help themselves first uh, now 91% of people that responded said they would use an online knowledge base if it were available and tailored to their needs so the better knowledge base you create the, the better usage you would get and 40% uh, of customers contact a call center after they have looked for answers to their question via self-service. So you can see that the self-help can really increase or well decrease the, the support prices. Uh, now, when, when it comes to applications that are existing, if you would want to use one of these, uh, it's a Zendesk, very well-known desk, user voice, and so on. Uh, you can build your own with Drupal, which is called Support Ticketing System, which will allow you to create the uh, interface for your end users where they can uh, you know, uh, create the tickets for you and then you can handle it uh, internally. And of course, you will need some sort of like a search functionality with Apache Sol Solar would be the best uh, choice there. Uh, now, when I was talking about these end user manuals, uh, which were usually exported as PDF or HTML, they were never updated, never read, and all about that I mentioned was frustrating for the for the author. Um, and just for your notice, uh, the end user manuals were here centuries ago. For example, this is like from a fencing manual, but they were facing some similar issues that we we have now. That you know they had some sort of like a knowledge that they thought that is the knowledge that everyone knows. Uh, but it was forgotten after a while. So if you read them now, you won't really understand everything. And finally, some facts about documentation. Uh, documentation is hard to budget. It can't be reused. It is time consuming. It is boring. And it is boring. And it is really very boring. And 
you know, documentation, when you think about it, uh, or most people would say, well, it's really everything bad you can imagine. Uh, but coming back to what I thought when I was thinking about this, like, you know, what we are doing here, and coming back to the quote or the paragraph that I found in the Design Museum that said, when we feel good, our thinking is more creative and we have an easier time solving the problems we face, uh, kind of lead to, to me thinking, well, the documentation is one of the processes in web development to make your client happy. And it's an, one of the necessary uh, you know, processes there that we need to kind of uh, take care of. And uh, yeah, because the clients don't want to bother you on the phone. Uh, you don't want to answer them. You don't want to spend time on that. So both sides, it will make happy if you make it right. Um, so takeaways from from this, uh, uh, from the from the research. Uh, if you start your research now, uh, you will do just you know it will be very good for you. Just start researching any part of your website that you think might need it, uh, even those that you consider that are uh, you know like uh, obvious. Uh, learn from your work uh, after you launch, and uh, analyze. Don't assume too often. Uh, of course, based on your on your experiences, and think about users, but keep businesses uh, business needs in mind. Otherwise, you won't. You might fail. That you know, you might have pretty interface, but the business uh, won't happen for you. Um, and from the self help, uh, the users want self help, self service, so they want to help themselves first. And providing the help is part of our process. And as well, there is a solution for that uh, that came from this problem. And I said that it was one of our problem. And the problem, uh, how we solved this, is that we created our own, our own application or our own product, which is called Inline Menu. Uh, now, uh, Jem, do you want me to uh, demo it right now? Do we have still some time? I can do it like in five minutes or so. Well, I find this uh, solution incredibly exciting, and I'd really, really like you to cover it. So, so please, uh, yes, feel free. Okay, great. So I'll start sharing my screen. I'll share my Chrome. Okay, great. So uh, can you see it? Yep. Okay, perfect. So it's called Inline Manual. And uh, let me show you how it works. You can try it on your own if you like afterwards. Uh, so here is uh, just a demo instance. It's on a. Uh, this is for just to show on Drupal. So it's on Drupal.inlinemanual.com. If you want to try it, you can. Uh, there is a small widget down there at the bottom corner. You can click that, or your end user can click that. And once you click it, here you see the the topics or the tutorials that the user can can take. I can click on this, and I'm going to be navigated through the whole processes with this. Uh, you know, with this, with these tool tips. So it told, it tells me like, okay, well, you are on this step, on that step, and uh, I'm going to continue clicking next. It can highlight the links. So let's say I can click on the create new account, and then it redirected me. You can see it in the background that there is like a user account the registration form. So now I can continue, and it shows me, okay, well, I need to fill in username. I fill in username, and so on. And then it goes through the whole process and create new account. And I can click create new account. So this is basically, you can imagine this way, uh, you know, um, documenting all the, let's say, content creation, all the workflows within the, com uh, with the, within the CMS and any other, uh, you know, tutorials or, yeah, whatever you want to teach your users. The good thing about this is that this widget is on every page. You can you can click on it. Uh, the client can click on it anywhere, and they will always get where they need to. It will redirect them to the right page, and so on. Now that's just just the first part. the The second part is the authoring tool because again, like I said, creating this documentation is really tough and really painful. Like creating screenshots, recording screencasts, you make mistake, you you have to re-record -re it or cut it. And so we have this Chrome extension, which is called Inline Manual uh, extension. Uh, and once I click on that, uh, I have to be logged into the uh, to the 
uh, okay let me just refresh that so as I said I need to be logged in so let me log in to the portal okay and let's just refresh okay so here is the uh, the Chrome extension I can browse the the tutorials that I created created we call them topics uh, I can browse by the sites as well that's just like a different filter so here I am on a drupal.inlinemanual.com I can click that uh, and I see the tutorial welcome to Drupal demo that we have seen just seconds ago and here I see the list of the steps so you see that I can really go through each of the steps I can see how it highlights and if I want to add a new step I just click here add a new step and I can assign the position of the step. So let's say I want it here on a on a title. I can change the position of the tooltip so so it's visible. So it can be at the bottom. I can change the step content. Hello there. Click the preview, and it will be there. Uh, you can as well click highlight so it will highlight the items. Uh, and if you use the reflex option, it will allow the user to click on the element, and it will go to another. Uh, another step so we can use it for let's say buttons and, and so on and then you can just click your your changes so that's that's the second part the authoring authoring part and the third part now is the the inline manual com portal itself which is kind of like for those who know github uh, this is sort of like a github for these tutorials and it enables the users uh, it's kind of like a central repository of all of these and here you can browse the topics which are the tutorials that we have seen uh, and uh, let's say if we click on how to create a page tutorial you can see who did what in the activity log so you can collaborate with others you can create an org organization as your client or so and put relevant people in there uh, so others can collaborate others can change the tutorials be developers or uh, or documentation managers uh, you can see the specific revisions so we can go back and forth you can see differences you can create releases which means that you can uh, actually create a release based on the revision uh, which means uh, I have a dev uh, site I have production site and you can choose to which uh, of these uh, which revision will go so uh, you can create a release 1.0 for the production it will affect only production and then you can still continue working on the development side and you know changing the tutorial but without affecting the, the production and the dev where the new features are being built that you need to document you can still continue that without affecting so we have this deployed deploy management here as well and uh, of course we have permissions where you can add team members and uh, you know collaborate easily we have this concept as well of using uh, the public and private tutorials uh, so uh, we are really trying to embrace this collaboration where for example with Drupal you can find public uh, tutorials that you can just take and put on your site or assign to your site uh, so for example add a user tutorial and that is kind of like a similar to every Drupal website so you can just take it put it on your site immediately or you can just take it clone it and let's say add a new uh, new step if you have a new you know field there and um, within the sites because you can assign these topics to your site so for example here we have this Drupal inline manual.com okay that's not how it should be but here you have the the tests where we can where you can test the uh, uh, whether it's still working so in essentially it goes to this website and it uh, uh, you know as a user sort of like a user on our server it goes here and it uh, tracks whether the tooltips are still there the elements are still there whether it's still working you, you can test it against different user roles user uh, names and so on and what's as well important is that uh, you can afterwards you can export it if you like and what it does is that it creates all these uh, you know uh, screenshots for you as well so it creates the screenshots of the links of the all the elements so for example here this username is actually the screenshots of the screenshot of the if you go here create new account is the screenshot of this field so it does 
all these kind of things for you. You can, whenever you change something, you can just re-export it and it will create this, if you need it, uh, this sort of offline documentation that you can later export to PDF or so. Uh, so I think that's that's about it. That's It's called uh, inline manual and you can go ahead, try it. There's a free version that you can use it as much as you can and uh, there are just some limitation in a regular usage but it's it's usable for these kind of things and that's how we solve our problem basically and so far clients are really liking it and it's very useful and for us it's very important that it's easy to create and for use and i think jim that's that's about it great so Inline Manual says there on the screen that it integrates with any website, Drupal, WordPress, Sugar CRM, Moodle, and more. How do you how do you how do you do that? Right. So we are trying to be platform independent. Uh, that's just because that uh, the Inline Manual can can work with any HTML based application. So uh, it's just that you need to integrate the widget in there. So for example, for the Drupal, we have. Uh, specific module uh, it's called again inline manual and which allows you to just enter like site api key and it will fetch all the topics for you all these tutorials for you and you don't have to do anything you know that's it so so it works really for any web html based application so it it uh, uh, technically speaking uh, it's all based on elements on the html elements on the selectors mm. so or those who knows the CSS selectors, so you can trigger, let's say, okay, well, I want it just for this button, and you set it for this selector, and it will show up there as a tooltip. Fantastic. That's really, really exciting. I like that you um, looked beyond Drupal as well. Marek, thank you so much for taking time to redo your session one more time, and um, I really look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, any last words from you? Let's see. You need to shamelessly plug inline manual once more, I'd say, at least. Oh, yeah. Well, first, thanks very much for having me in this first kind of, I really like this idea of Drupal, you know, camp online, like this Champs Drupal camp. It's really nice. And for the inline manual, I think it really fixes the problem that we, you know, wanted to fix. So I'm really quite excited about that as well. And it's sort of like my focus right now. And yeah. So I encourage anyone to give it a try, and yeah, I think it will work for everyone. Terrific. Okay, so that's it from the very first session of Jam's Drupal Camp, and I look forward to seeing um, you all and many others at the next Jam Jam's Drupal Camp. <laughs> that's funny to say, and at you know real life events around the world in the coming weeks and next year. So. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you one more time, Marek. Everybody, uh, good night, good thank afternoon, you. whatever your time zone is. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Marek. Bye.